Hello, good morning everyone. Welcome to our webinar for the 2022 National Climate Change Consciousness Week. This is Jeffrey A. Kodala. I will be your host and facilitator for today's activity. But before we go with our program, let me give you a brief background on our observance of the 2022 National Climate Change Consciousness Week. Hello, good morning, everyone. The proclamation number 1667. On global warming and climate change by pursuing broad and intensive confidence for the implementation of things to secure the collective cooperation in the private and public sector. But before going deeper on our topic today, it is my proper to start our program with a prayer. A prayer on climate change. A prayer on climate change. Loving God, we thank you for our planet Earth, which is our home. It has evolved over millions of years. It continues to be a source of life and a place that holds all our lives together. Today, though, our planet is under threat from pollution, climate change, and increasing carbon dioxide levels. As our planet heats up, the cycles of life are out of balance and under threat. We pray that our world political leaders will continue to make good decisions that will impact our future for the better. We pray for a world that will not be threatened by a changing climate that chokes our atmosphere. We pray for a world where the poorest and most vulnerable can live their lives fairly and with hope. We pray that this wonderful planet will be in a much better shape for future generations to come. We pray for a team effort, not just at global level, but also in our own local community and parish. And finally, help us all to be the difference. Help us to know that every small and tiny change in reducing our carbon footprint does in fact make a world of a difference. Amen. Amen. So uh, let me call on our, our OIC director of the Namibia Hydrography Branch to give us his welcome remarks. Take it away, uh, Captain Antonio G. Valenzuela Jr. Good morning, Sir Tony. Uh, good morning, Jeff, and thank you. And good morning, Paul Salahat. And welcome to the Namria webinar entitled Sea Level Rise Is It Climate Change or Land Subsidence? Uh, first and foremost, congratulations to all the facilitators, resource speakers, and the management team for organizing this learning activity as part of our 2022 National Climate Change Consciousness Week. Today's webinar will discuss the long-term sea level trends as observed on Amria tide stations installed throughout the Philippines. The rise and fall of sea level may be attributed to several factors, such as the thermal expansion of water due to global warming, tectonic activity, or vertical land motion. It is important to note that a rising sea level trend observed 
in a tight station may not be due to rising sea level, but due to subsiding soil where it is located. For this reason, sea level measurements from tide stations need to be tied in with other measurements, such as those from active geodetic stations and satellite altimetry in order to ascertain the occurrence of sea level rise. I hope that this webinar will be a good opportunity to understand the current sea level trends and may it also raise awareness on the importance of physical oceanography in climate change adaptation studies. So let us all have a good day ahead and thank you very much. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Magandang umaga, Sir Tony. Maraming salamat po sa inyong mensahe para sa amin ngayong araw na ito. So before we go on to our lectures, we have two lectures for today's webinar. But uh, before going deeper into that, uh, meron po kaming hinandang dalawang audiovisual presentations. The first ABP is about the profile of the National Mapping and Resource Information Authority. And the second ABP will be... Uh, to, and the second ABP will be an excerpt of the interview of CNA Insider, uh, particularly the uh, documentary on Asia's sinking cities. So na-focus na sa isang episode nila ang City of Manila. So ang at isa sa mga in-interview doon ay ang ating in, uh, resource speaker na mamaya ko ipapakilala sa inyo. So let's uh, go and watch our audiovisual presentations. Take it away, Erwin. Good morning. Maps are essential tools to help people locate objects, features, and events and navigate their way on the surface of the Earth. Maps enable us to discover, know, and analyze our environment. Maps provide information to be used for planning, decision-making, operations, and governance. More than 80% of the information needed in everyday life deal with location or geography of people, places, things, and events. The National Mapping and Resource Information Authority, or NAMRIA, plays an important role in generating and managing maps and geospatial information. It is an agency of the Philippine government attached to the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, or DENR. As the country's central mapping and geospatial information management agency, NAMRIA serves the needs of the line services of DENR, other government offices, and the general public. The Maria's mission is to provide quality topographic maps, nautical charts, and other geospatial products and services in a timely and coordinated manner. The Maria envisions itself to be a center of excellence, building a geospatially empowered Philippines where government, businesses, and individuals make full use of geospatial information in making important decisions and conducting their daily activities. NAMRIA has four core functions. NAMRIA produces topographic and derivative maps on various scales, in paper or digital forms. These are used as basic tools and references by the government for infrastructure and development planning, disaster risk reduction and management, environmental protection, and research and development. They are also used by the private sector in investment planning and exploration, by the academic and science communities in research activities, and by the general public. Topographic maps are regularly updated using satellite images and aerial photographs and from the conduct of field validation surveys. Small and medium-scale topographic maps of 1 to 250,000 and a 1 to 50,000 scale respectively 
generally cover large areas for macro planning. Large-scale topographic maps of 1 to 10,000 and 1 to 4,000 scale or larger cover smaller areas but are more accurate and show more detail. Namria, likewise, produces updated administrative maps in the form of provincial and regional maps. Pursuant to Executive Order No. 192, Namria is mandated to establish and maintain the primary geodetic control network for all surveying and mapping in the country. It is in line with this mandate that the agency is undertaking the modernization of the Philippine Geodetic Reference System, or PGRS, as part of its vision of building a geospatially empowered Philippines. The modernization program is aligned with Resolution 266, adopted by the United Nations General Assembly during its 69th session, dated 26 February 2015, that recommends the adoption and active participation of member states. In the definition of a Global Geodetic Reference Frame, or GGRF, for sustainable development. The program will upgrade the existing Philippine Reference System of 1992 from a static and local system to a datum aligned with a GGRF that is in sync with real-world ground deformations and is managed and utilized by competent PGRS stakeholders. Namria conducts hydrographic and physical oceanographic surveys and produces nautical charts like berthing, harbor, approach, coastal, general sailing, and overview charts covering the country's maritime jurisdictions. The agency also publishes predicted tide and current tables, coast pilot books, lists of lights, notices to mariners, and other nautical publications. Nautical charts and publications ensure safety in maritime navigation and provide basic information for the management of the maritime space and resources, as well as base data for climate change studies. Charts and hydrographic data are important in complying with the provisions of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea relative to the country's maritime entitlements. Likewise, the nautical publications are required under the Safety of Life at Sea Convention under the International Maritime Organization. Namria is responsible for the survey and mapping of the country's terrestrial and maritime territories. It delineates the different maritime zones of the archipelago, including the exclusive economic zone and continental shelves. It spearheaded the successful defense in 2012 of the country's submission to the United Nations for an extended continental shelf in the Benham Rice region, now called Philippine Rice. It also provides technical support to various government agencies on matters pertaining to maritime battery delimitation and law of the sea issues as well as to the local government units in the delineation and delimitation of the 15-kilometer municipal water boundaries. Namria conducts nationwide environment and natural resource assessment and mapping of various thematic geospatial information such as land cover, coastal resources, inundation of coastal low-lying areas at various sea-level rise scenarios, Tenorial instruments, and upland or forest land population, among others. These fundamental data sets serve as vital inputs to policy formulation, physical and developmental planning, provision of social services, disaster risk reduction and management, and climate change mitigation and adaptation studies on various levels. In addition, the agency continues to provide information on classification of lands of the public domain as well as technical assistance to DENR and the final mapping and preparation of draft house bills, fixing the final forest limits of the country, including validation of the general location of areas under the National Integrated Protected Area System, among other mapping requirements. 
ng Maria's Geospatial Information and Management Services include information system strategic planning, geospatial databasing, information and web system development, information and communications technology, resource and network management, geographic information systems or GIS project collaboration and technical assistance, GIS trainings, packaging of geospatial information products and services, stakeholder relations and partnership development, information, education, and communication and client services. Namria also plays active roles and even acts as lead in local and international programs in the area of geospatial information management and services relevant to disaster risk reduction and management and climate change adaptation. Namria spearheads the implementation of the National Spatial Data Infrastructure, or NSDI, which is designed to provide a mechanism for sharing of and access to geospatial information produced and maintained by the various stakeholders and custodians across the country. A major output of the NSDI is GeoPortal Philippines. This application system, managed by Namria, serves as a platform for online and open sharing of geospatial information. Namria also assists other government agencies and the general public in disaster mapping. Namria is one of the member agencies of the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, or NDRRMC. The agency collaborates with other government agencies in the production of multi-hazard maps and information, education, and communication campaigns in various local government units. Namria also assists Congress in the crafting of priority bills on maritime zones, archipelagic sea lanes, land classification, comprehensive land use, and protected areas, among others. From its humble beginnings in 1987, Namria has come a long way and stands firm in accomplishing its mandated tasks and responsibilities to its clients and stakeholders and to the goals of DENR. This is the National Mapping and Resource Information Authority an agency helping to build a geospatially empowered Philippines. Welcome to Namria. This is Manila, center of finance, education, and the seat of power of the Philippines for many centuries. Manila City was also once regarded as the most densely populated among all cities in the world. Today, it faces a looming threat to its existence along with the other surrounding cities. Based on satellite images and physical evidence, parts of the megacity are sinking continuously due to rising sea levels, while some of the communities around Manila Bay are already engulfed by water. You look at the uh, global average, it's pegged at 3.2 millimeters per year. That's the global average. For, for the country, it's, it varies, it's diverse. But the most notable one is, of course, uh, Manila Bay. It's, it's already been, uh, it's accepted. So we have 13.2 millimeters per year up to 2018. Two points there. So it's probably the ground subsidence or the climate change. So the, the, I think the global average 3.2, it, uh, it's the uh, collective uh, uh, amount, the collective rate. Ayan, so the first, uh, again, the first video was the profile of the National Mapping and Resource Information Authority, immediately followed by an excerpt from the documentary, Asia Sinking Cities, which focused uh, Manila at isa sa mga resource person natin doon at, at, at ang isa sa mga in-interview doon ay ang magiging resource person natin today so it's very exciting so without any further ado let me welcome you on the lecture proper of our webinar so our first speaker who will be discussing 
uh, C-level trends and a media perspective is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Electronics and Communication Engineering at the University of the East Caloocan City. He earned a diploma in Applied Geodesy and Photogrammetry at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, in 1991. He completed his master's degree in Marine Management at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, Canada in 2003. He was a recipient of various technical trainings related to his work, such as the hydrography training course held in the National Tidal Facility, uh, delayed South Australia in 1992, and a surveying and mapping course at the Geographical Survey Institute at Japan in 1996. He is a well-qualified and trained surveyor with a combined 33 years of surveying experience and academic background in the field of oceanography, hydrography, geodesy, and geophysics. His work experiences include being an oceanographer and geophysicist at the National Mapping and Resource Information Authority. He was a member of the Philippine delegation that successfully defended the Philippines' claim at an extended continental shelf in the Benham Rice region. Now, we are calling it Philippine Rice. Before the United Nations Commission of the Limits of the Continental Shelf in New York, USA, he was a member of the technical working group that successfully negotiated the exclusive economic zone boundary between the Republic of the Philippines and the Republic of Indonesia. He was the Philippine representative to the meeting of the General Bathymetric Chart of the Oceans Subcommittee on Undersea Features Names that deliberated on the undersea feature name proposals of the country in 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. He is currently the chief of the Physical Oceanographer Division of the Hydrography Branch of NAMIA. Friends, uh, a round of applause to our first resource speaker, Mr. Dennis Arsenio B. Bringas. Take it away, Sir Dennis. Magandang umaga po. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for that uh, introduction. So, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to our viewers online. And uh, uh, moderator, am I am I online? Am I okay now? Yes, sir. You are. I don't know. We are currently okay. seeing you right now. Loud and clear. Okay, uh, let me show you my first slide. Let me share my first slide. So how, how many actually are online here? Uh, so YouTube, po, sir, more than 200 plus na po. Oh. <laughs> that would be a lot of pressure on me. <laughs> so uh, let me share my slide today. Okay. How about this? Uh, can you see my slide? Let me just remove my... Yes, sir. We are seeing your slide. Okay. So, again, welcome. Uh, uh, with that uh, several audio video presentations, uh, I would like to share to you a, a, a more insights on the uh, subject matter from Namiap. Namriya perspective. Okay. Uh, so the title of this uh, uh, sort of uh, web uh, webinar is on the sea level rise. Is it climate change or land subsidence? I will move. Okay, for outline of this uh, presentation would be uh, like uh, we're talking once again of the mandates and core functions, of course, of the uh, physical oceanography division, one of the divisions of uh, hydrographic branch. So, and uh, it's uh, 
general functions according to its uh, organizational structure. Next would be the, I'll give you a uh, profile of uh, the type stations. These are the stations that are responsible to collect uh, the sea level data throughout the country. So, and I would like to uh, note on what products and services that this uh, data can be derived. So for the, I would like also to show you something about the data applications, the sea level data applications. Uh, we are talking here of the clients who will use our data. So, and uh, for the topic, another topic, I would like to give you an overview of the sea level rise, not much on the scientific uh, side, but on the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the way it's easily understood by the general public. So I would like to also present the sea level trends according to Namria's perspective or according to Namria's data right now. So, and I will be discussing uh, a few relevant cooperation projects that uh, mainly use our data. And of course, we have a collaborative project with uh, UP, I will be uh, just discussing the uh, important parts of the project. And I would like to make some concluding remarks about the sea level change, sea level rise. Okay, so about Namria, the, the, the ABP presented to you a very detailed uh, uh, function or mandates of Namria. So I'd like to just emphasize that it's aside from the map makings in general, but we also do the charting. So, well, the core fraction was uh, detailed in the ABP, but in our, uh, in Namria is composed of uh, four, four technical branches and the hydrography branch where we belong conducts the oceanographic uh, surveys. Okay, for the, Physical Oceanography Division, our division, I group our uh, responsibilities as the functional and the operational, okay? For the functional, the POD is responsible for the establishment and determination of reliable vertical reference datum. So these datum are primarily used in the hydrographic surveys, one of the major function of uh, the NAMRIA, to, to be used in nautical charting and of course topographic mapping depending on the reference datum that you want. So we will we can provide the all the different vertical datums. So we are responsible for the annual publication of the type and current table, simply the TCT. Uh, I think this is a is needed when you go. Uh, it's needed by seagoing vessels. It is a requirement of a marina that uh, they have to have this uh, uh, printout of the book of the time and current tables annually. So we are also responsible for the generation, distribution and publication and updating and archiving of related physical. So I, I, I mentioned here physical because there are, other, there are other types of oceanography. So we only do the physical oceanographic uh, um, of this type. No? Uh, available to scientists and researchers. So it is a like a repository of the different physical oceanographic available in the country, and these are shared through our NODC, or what we call the National Oceanographic Data Center. So we provide for, for the uh, developers or the uh, you know, coastal developers, we provide certification of data and information on various physical oceanographic data requests. So these are like the uh, Vertical datums, I think they are being used by port, uh, port operations or construction of a pier 
they're being used uh, by those uh, kind of uh, activities. For the operational ones, this is a regular activity of the physical oceanographic division. We operate and maintain the network of primary or permanent tide stations throughout the country. As of now, we have 60 permanent, but uh, we have uh, lots of what we call the secondary or subordinate stations. So we predict tides, of course, and tidal currents at various locations. So depending on the uh, collected data, where the collected data are, so we can predict tides on those uh, areas. So to ensure the stability of the tide gauges or the measuring equipment, we maintain the tide gates by annually visiting them, inspection, inspecting them, and conduct tidal leveling. So we will know if the tide gates benchmarks are moving. So we conduct also, aside from the tidal observation, we conduct uh, uh, tidal current and wave observations, uh, but these are not uh, like the permanent ones. We only conduct usually around uh, one month. We conduct this kind of uh, observations. Of course, to support uh, our hydrography, hydrographic surveys, we, in conjunction with the hydrographic surveys, we establish what we call the secondary or subordinate tide stations to have their data corrections, to provide data corrections. So at, in, uh, in our, at our tide stations, that those are 60 tide stations, we also measure uh, sea surface temperature, density, and salinity, just to optimize the, uh, you know, the operation of the tide stations. So we measure these other physical properties of the ocean. Okay, so for the uh, station profile, so this is a map where the primary tide stations of Camarilla are. So we have 60, just like what I said. So in Mindanao, at least uh, 14 or the 23%. In Luzon, it's 29 or 49% of 60. In the Visayas, we have 17. That relates to 28%. Okay, so for the class, we are looking at how 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 these stations are constructed. So we have the concrete type or what we call the portable ones. Depending on our host institution, usually the Philippine Ports Authority, they don't want you know to sometimes uh, put up a permanent uh, ones because of, it might uh, disrupt uh, port operations. So we, we establish a portable type of uh, tide gates. So in order to, you know, you can easily move when, when the port development comes. So for the type of tide gates, these are the uh, instruments that we use. We have the digital ones. It's, uh, it's quite uh, newer than the analog one. So for the analog, we have 41%, uh, 41 stations that uses only analog, meaning there's no digital type. When you say digital type, it's the sensors. So we have 19 of those who uses the digital uh, tide gauges. And for the transmission systems, we have the non-real time. These are with no modem whatsoever. So we have 20 or 33%. So for the near real time, these are transmitting uh, usually every minute, every six minutes or every 10 minutes. So we have 40 of those or 67%. For the data collection, we have what we call the single sensor and the redundant. The redundant one is uh, like uh, you have a backup backup sensor in case the other one uh, will be, you know will be destroyed. So we have uh, for the time stations, we have twenty seven of those have uh, at least two uh, two sensors, two types of uh, data collection uh, time gates, and the rest every single one and just single. So that's the that's the risk if the sensor will be destroyed or you know malfunction. You don't have a data collection. Okay, so as I said we have 60 primary stations. We do have also what we call the secondary 
tile stations. These are tile, tile stations that probably at one time in the from one time in the past they have started uh, uh, data collections or data observation tidal observation at least uh, less less than a year less than a year. So I, I, please note. Uh, I think I, I think there are two hundred viewers we have. We have yes we have tile stations in Pagasa that's in the West Philippine Sea. We have two. We have in Pagasa and we have Lawa. So these are the type of you know the it's a portable tide station or portable tide gates that we set up in the in Pagasa Island. This this one. Can you see the first? Can you see my pointer? This one. Okay. So for a secondary tide station, we usually install this type of setup configuration of that station. We have just recently uh, uh, observed, tidal, conducted tidal observation in Bulalacao. I think this is uh, Negros, Oriental. So we have at least 265 secondary or uh, subordinate stations. This is what we, we are at that, what I was saying a while ago that in support of my hydrographic service, we install at least, uh, we, we conduct at least one month tidal observation, less than a month or one month uh, tidal observation. It's, it's a requirement for tidal observations. So 265 of those scattered throughout the country. So I think 62, as you can see in the map, 62 stations are observed during 1960s up and the rest the 200, Three subordinate stations are below 1960, meaning uh, since uh, probably 1947 or 1901, when tidal observations were first conducted in the country in 1901, conducted by the USG, USCGS. So these are the type of uh, you know, um, subordinate stations we have. We have 265. We have a program to we observe these uh, tide stations to update the tidal observation and eventually the what we call the tidal constituents in order to augment our tidal predictions. So we also conduct uh, frequent you know, tidal current observations. So we have already conducted at least 76 locations. Usually, those are located in uh, straits or pass. So we have this. Uh, we use a instrument called the ADCP or the the S4 or the current meter. This is a one layer current meter, the S4. That is the ADCP is a multi layer current uh, meter. So this is just, I'm just showing you the results of a pre-processing of the tidal current observation. observation. Okay. So just, just very recent, we started to, you know, to conduct wave observations. So in fact, we have already 15, uh, but many of those are conducted uh, uh, beyond, uh, prior, prior to 2015, I think, because the the tide gates being used that this the location is used to be a tide station but uh, fortunately the tide gates use was what we call the tide tide and wave gates t t w tide uh, wtg wave and tide gates instrument so it's a dual type of instrument it's it uh, collects tides and wave. So we have uh, 15 of those, and it's in the already in the annual uh, program of the Namria uh, of the POD to conduct further wave observations some other parts of the country. Okay, and for the data outputs and products, and also who, who uses our products. So the, the regular one, we have the, the popular one, we have the tide and current tables. We usually publish them 
before the before the following year. So we usually uh, made make them available uh, by October. So meaning 2023 is already available from our uh, from our sales offices throughout the country. So 2030, 2023 is already out. So title information. So we we certify the information on the elevation of the different uh, tide gauge benchmark or the benchmark, simply benchmark. Okay, we have a uh, sort of a database of all those established uh, tide gauge benchmark with uh, with our uh, tide station because it's a requirement for a tidal observation that you have to establish a reference mark on the ground. So we use. We call it the tide gauge benchmark. So we we have clients who wants the a certified elevation of those uh, information. So we we issue those uh, type of uh, certifications. Okay, for data sharing, so we we share our data, especially if uh, it's for research, especially the academy. We always share our data. So just like this one, right, this is a student from the University of the Philippines. Probably he, she, she is the Yatas Diana. She is doing some sort of a thesis or something. So they, they requested the uh, tidal data from uh, from uh, La Maria. So we provide them, we provide them free. We provide, we provide the data for free. We just write to our uh, administrator, uh, Yusek Peter Janko, then we will give you free the data okay so we try to look at the profile of our clients so, so i choose 2015 until 2022 for those so, so we, we 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 store their information so for 2015 i would like to emphasize on the research in the research uh, sector scientific research sector so in 2015 it's only around nine percent okay and from then on, it steadily increases results. So it, it, this is very interesting because it, the tidal data is now evolved, not only for navigational topics, but it's now on research, on scientific uh, studies. So. so in 2016, it went up to 27% for research. And 2017, 42%. And 2018, well, probably those uh, who need the data, these are new new clients, probably, but still, still uh, beyond, uh, you know, 10 uh, percent. So research for 2018, 34 percent, and again in 2019, 38 percent for research. And 2020, that's probably during the pandemic, they choose to you know to just conduct online research. So we have 48 percent. And 2021 again, it's it's uh, really up. You know? So in 2022, uh, as of now, it's around 30 30 percent already. Okay. So well, this the the actually the part of the the main part of this uh, presentation. First, uh, the the why and the what and the why's. Okay. So what is climate change? So according to United Nations, climate change refers to long-term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns. So long-term. So the term there is long-term. So it means history. Okay. So why sea level? Okay. So according to Gloss, sea level is one of the most useful oceanographic variables used for scientific, economic, and social purposes, okay? Working to close, or the global sea level observation system. So with that, sea level data is vital to research into sea level change and ocean circulation. That's why I'm telling, I'm mentioning that uh, tidal data is evolved into other applications, okay? So just to give you our insights, number of insights on the sea level rise. So, well, as a background, 
Still background. Global sea level is rising. So that's the general, that's the perception. So it's around 3.4 millimeters per year according to NASA, NASA data. So this, uh, the, the, our director mentioned the, the factors that affects the sea level, the, the rising of the sea level. It's probably the ocean thermal expansion or the heating of the earth, which uh, is getting warmer. So with that, the, the ice, ice glaciers are being melted, usually from the Antarctic or the Greenland. But few of our sites, I've, I've read some, you know, some journals that, you know, they, they, they say it's, it's not melting. Some others said, so uh, say it's melting. So we don't know. So the other factor, we look at the land subsidence due to anthropogenic or the man-made activities. So later on, this part of the presentation, I'll show you some of the main, main, uh, major anthropogenic activities. Okay, this is the estimated contribution of the rise in the sea level, global sea level rise. No? So this was uh, already mentioned from the previous slides. So where, where those uh, components come from? So it's thermal expansion, mountain glaciers or the ice sheets, the Antarctic ice, so it's mainly ice, impoundment of groundwater mining. This is uh, uh, the withdrawal of uh, groundwater. So they have the estimates low, high, medium, and high. So what the what we are saying this is the, the there is there is indeed a a net net uh, rise of the sea level. You call it that net because the low estimate is around negative, but the high estimate is around thirty seven. So the net net rise is still positive. So it is uh, really going up. So according to that's according to the IPCC, and uh, this is in the in the in the right side the graphic representation of that uh, estimate. Okay, so this is from NASA. So actually, there are a lot of sources from the internet, but uh, they almost show the same trend. Okay, so this, as I mentioned, uh, the anthropogenic activities or the man-made activities that tend to contribute to the sea level rise. Okay, one, groundwater, oil and gas mining. This is the uh, the withdrawal of the groundwater so water impoundment or channelization this is structure of dams probably flood controls okay a vegetation clearance this is a, a you know a controversial topic uh, topic vegetation clearance or deforestation okay other activities that may affect the hydrologic cycle. I'll show you the hydrologic cycle uh, from for the uh, in the in the succeeding slides. Okay, so this is the how how the water circulates. Okay, so we have the the numbers there shows you the volume of water in millions of cubic kilometers. So we have from the atmosphere. Uh, so this is the cycle. I think uh, during our elementary days, we, we already have this kind of uh, information. So from the atmosphere, the rains, precipitation, then everything will go to the ocean or some to the ground water, penetrates to the, into the ground. Okay. So the influence, now we look at the influence of the man-made activities on the sea level rise. So this is a graphic representation, a non-scientific a non, uh, you know, non formula. So SLR, the sea level rise, is equal to the G plus U plus C plus D plus W. The G is the groundwater. The U is the urbanization. 
C is the condensation that's uh, probably from the smoke that's been emitted in the from from factories. D the, the, the deforestation. The W is the wetland the destruction, and minus that with the, the you know the the relative humidity or rain rainwater and the infiltration from the from from uh, because uh, not everything from the rain is being collected by the ground so some are being uh, run off to the ocean as a runoff okay okay to summarize the hydrological effects so it depends on the what land use you are talking about and what is the probably the effect okay for the land use uh, change on deforestation it decreases interpretation, intersection, evapotranspiration, infiltration capacity, or you know the oil uh, porosity, increase in surface runoff. So, uh, well, you, you don't have those trees to capture the uh, to the delay, delay delay the runoff. So it's it just flows straight to the ocean. Okay, so that's how it is when you have the deforestation. Urbanization, of course, decreases in infiltration, population, increases again, increases surface runoff, changes in grounded uh, groundwater levels. I, I, uh, I will show you in the succeeding slides what the urbanization in Manila uh, have uh, affected the sea level. So those are the price that we have to pay during urbanization. So for the agriculture, same I think same too with the deforestation. We have an increase as uh, so surface runoff. Okay. So wetland drainage, so the destruction of the wetlands, it also decreases uh, the uh, the retention capacity of the the, the wetlands. So now. I, I talk about the you know the uh, uh, sea level rise that is probably due to the climate change. Okay, now we we'll try to look at the other factor, uh, the land subsidence due to those anthropogenic activities. You have what we call the natural and the human induced. So for the natural, that's the tectonic or the you know the earthquake. So. There's a movement, of course, of the crust. So some sediments may realign, so they they they, they compact, and of course, the the, the land uh, on top of it will probably it probably goes down or goes up depending on what type of tectonic. So rivers river sediment runoff. These are the sediments coming from the mountains that uh, you know that. Uh, runs through the river, the river. So human induced groundwater. These are the the man-made you know, activities. Groundwater. This was mentioned a while ago. Groundwater mining or the groundwater extraction. Vegetation clearing or grazing. So these are instead of the the vegetation you. You do some cement road road widening or something. You you do you, you cement those uh, areas that's grazing. So the water, the tendency of the water is just go straight up to the ocean. It's not, it won't penetrate the ground because it's already concreted. Deforestation, of course, land reclamation, and another probably a, a an issue again <laughs> land reclamation. And of course, other activities affecting hydrology, the hydrologic cycle. Okay, so taking those two, we I I I, uh, I cited some coupling coupling effect, meaning they are interrelated. The sea level rise and the land subsidence. Okay, so it accelerates sea level rise. It depends on uh, the degree, the degree of you know uh, the growth or urbanization and the uh, excessive ground uh, water it depends on the degree of the uh, those activities 
So ecological systems and values will be affected. Okay, so there would be probably salt intrusion into aquifers, aquifers, marshes, estuaries, or wetlands. Okay. So frequent flooding and inundation. I think we already been experiencing this. So rapid land use, land loss, and displaced population. And of course, all of these would be economic problems. Okay. So I just mentioned the uh, the sea level trends uh, as a perspective of Namria. So for Manila, we, we just uh, first we focus on Manila. So Manila, we have data from since 1901 until now, still continuing. But we can uh, we can group those uh, trends. Uh, we can we can group like a period. We have uh, Manila from not the, the 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 middle graph is. Manila 1947 to 2002. So, and Manila 1965, 2021. So, why, why 1965? I mentioned the urbanization. I think this was started in 1965. Okay. So, those three, three periods, we can see at least three different uh, values. For the first one, it's around 8.5. Four millimeters per year if you try to include the data from 1901. But for 1947, it is uh, the rate is 13.2. This was this is what uh, this is the the trend that was used uh, during our cooperative project with uh, UP. We have a cooperative research project with UP. I will. I will uh, just present to you the, the important ones in that project. So for that, we have 13.3. So if you take out those, the 1947, you start in the, during the industrialization or the urbanization of Manila, we have 14.4, okay? This, this uh, difference, uh, the one millimeter difference is, you know, will be, I will, I will share later on, where, where the one millimeter came from from the when you take out the 1947 uh, period okay for the rest of the long-term stations that we have we have for Legaspi we have around six it is showing around six millimeters per year for Legaspi Legaspi city for Cebu it's uh, quite uh, moderate. No, 1.2 millimeters per year. That's a 1947 to 19 to 2021 data. For Davao, we have uh, 3.6. Depends on how how you qualify this kind of race. Depends on our you know our researchers. So for Davao, and for the rest of the uh, the long term. Uh, Stations. I will show you a, a graph of uh, how, how we classify long-term and short-term stations later. So for Puerto Princesa, it's around 4.8 millimeters per year. But the data is only from 1990 to 2021. Started uh, observations Puerto Princesa just around that year, 1990. For Real Queso, Real Queso. So we have uh, the rate of increase is around 3.6 millimeters per year. For Mindoro, it's around, it's from the same for Mindoro. I, I, I'm just showing you the factual, you know, factual basis of those trends. For Surigao, Surigao City, we have around uh, 4.8. So for Hulu, it's, well, for Hulu, it's stable probably because it's less than one millimeter per year. But the observation stopped in 1996. But still, we still have a more than 19 years uh, data from Hulu. So for Port Irene, this is in Cagre and Valley. We have a gap there, meaning that we don't have uh, data for these years. So the rate of increase is around 4.8. You know, 
So this is a simple uh, fun we, we got this trend from the simple functionality of Excel. So probably in higher higher statistics, probably they will show you this different uh, different uh, values. For the other sites, we have Tacloban. And again, we have San Fernando, Tacloban, San Buanga. We have lots of data gaps, meaning that uh, probably they don't have the data or the, the instruments were you know, bugged down. They were not properly maintained, probably. So we have data gaps. So you can not actually conclude those uh, rate because of those large data gaps. So the, the important thing here is to, you know, we have long-term, should be long-term observation that you can establish the trends on the sea level. For a summary of those uh, stations, around 13, we have around 13 stations that have at least 19 years uh, data or 19 years in operation, excluding, of course, those data gaps. So these are the stations. So you can uh, note that uh, Tacloban exhibits negative negative rate. So meaning they are decreasing. Of course, some wrong. They are decreasing. We don't know probably what's causing those data. Just I told you that's conclusive because there are a lot of uh, gaps in the data. Okay. So these are the long term stations. So we have thirteen. So we, we classify long-term stations around uh, if it is already 19 years in operation or 19 years uh, no, data, more than 19 years. So we have at least three for, for the country. And for the short term, so I told you the first slide, we have 60. So the 49, the, the rest is fairly new. They're still baby, so, so to speak. No? So per to Azul, well, Puerto Azul and Hulu are not part of the permanent and 24 hour operational tide gates, tide stations. So we have this uh, still quite new stations. So, so these are the stations. This is around 49. Okay, uh, I mentioned that uh, we do to optimize the uh, operation of the tide station. We, can, we also conduct from time to time, temperature, density, and salinity observations or measurements. So we have from those uh, permanent stations, we have, I mean, the long-term stations, we have the 13. So we, we do have temperature, density, and salinity data. So what we do here is we collect uh, the seawater in the, in, in, the, in the morning, and in the afternoon, we collect and we observe uh, those uh, parameters. And for the other sonographic data like the CTD and XBT, these are being done uh, on our survey vessels during their hydrographic activities. So we also do have the CTD or the XBT data from 1999. That's when our ships were procured up to present. So it's a part of the activity of the oceanographic survey vessels during their conduct of service. So I mentioned the uh, relevant uh, cooperation products that we have in the sea level. So we have an MOU on the co-management of tsunami or sea level monitoring stations. That's how the uh, PBOX call it. So this is just to assist them in the tidal data processing and maintain their station through tidal leveling. Okay. Okay, so we 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 conducted the training for them in 19 in 2016. So this uh, map here is the stations are uh, from Pbox. They call it the tsunami monitoring stations. So this is the uh, picture of those stations located. Uh, well, some are co-located with our stations. Some are uh, probably depends on their criteria, like uh, where are the 
uh, earthquake kind of holy hold up okay. fault, fault lines probably where where the fault, fault lines are so they probably different they, they they probably have a different criteria for choosing those uh, tide stations or tsunami tide stations so this is just the uh, mou signed by uh, the former, the uh, former uh, secretary, now secretary Renato Sulidum, signed by our with our administrator Peter and Chanko. So for the MOU on the provision of sea level data to mitigate coastal hazard due to storm storm surge. So we develop with this uh, with this uh, cooperation project. We develop uh, what we call the SOP for Namria to provide real time. Uh, sea level data, uh, of course, reduced to the local datum of affected stations, tide stations during typhoons. So we have this type of MOU with Pagasa. So this is the this is again signed by our administrator and of course the also the current administrator of Pagasa, Dr. Malano. Okay, so just like I said, we develop a number standard operating procedure. For that, uh, you know, for that process, and how to transmit or provide uh, Pagasa the sea level data. Okay, so this is a, a, a sample report report for the terms of be, being uh, given to Pagasa. This is from the typh typhoon Udet. You know, this was uh, during in. in December 16, 2021, so very recent. Ito yung very destructive the typhoon din dito. Okay, so that's the sample report of our oceanographers being submitted to uh, Pagasa for their, for their, you know, for their use probably in their models. Okay, so I, I have here the, I just recently concluded cooperation project with the UP Geodetic Engineering. So this, we call it the Coastal Sea Level Rise or the CSLR. This uh, will provide sea level data from 25, not all the stations where this citation data were provided, only 25, they chose only 25. So we provide GNS data on tide gauge benchmark from those uh, tide stations. We, the project, the cooperative project also developed a GNS type of tide gates, uh, whether being in the uh, located in the pier or offshore, and using a buoy. So we call that a tide gates buoy. So, so this project would also determine the occurrence of land subsidence or uplift in the area and compute or estimate rate of sea level rise or establish the trend on coastal areas where tide gauges are unavailable. Okay, so this is the uh, conceptual framework objectives of that project uh, with the permission from the uh, co-project co, co leader from the UPDGE. I, I, I got their permission to just to give you an overview on this, on this project. So again, uh, this is the detailed objective to quantify sea level rise and rise at the 25 selected stations. So using on-site or the, the actual tide gauge data and space-based measurements. So this, this will be involved as the satellite uh, data to determine influence of local factors to SLR. So it's not a global one. So we focus on the local local uh, situation situation okay to develop of course the prototype of the of the low cost gns tide gauge float or buoy for sea level monitoring this is a new concept actually for us for us so local sea level so the the, the project also already considered the global average of the 3.2 millimeters per year, uh, the global average from, from the from Nerem, the outer Nerem. 
based on local conditions. So these are the, the agencies that were involved in this project, the DST book, of course, uh, Pag-asa, uh, very minimal yata ang lalaki books, that you have this logo, and Amriya, UP, DG, and a private entity. Yeah, I, I can read this one. Okay. But the, the project was mainly funded by the USD. So the study sites, okay? So uh, these are only the sites that were, uh, that were part of the project. So of these sites, eight of those are with the active or co-located GNSS. That's our stations that also have the GNS antenna. Those are, we have nine, but unfortunately Cebu is not operational during that project. So they also use this data to look at the lands of land subsidence contribution to the sea level rise of those 25 areas. Okay, so data sources of this project, of course we have our actual data from our uh, tide stations. And we, they, the project used the satellite altimeter data because it said to be that it's not affected by any ground movement. Okay, and they also use the Sentinel-1 images that supposedly detects ground movement. And of course, our co-located GNSS tide images, tide stations, that would probably detect ground movement. Yeah, I am still on time. So I just give you the uh, I, I don't I don't want to go into the details of the project. Uh, I just want to cite the few project conclusions. So, so the coastal these are the uh, conclusions that were derived by the project. Coastal sea level rise or fall depends on the strong influence of local. So it's localized. Local factors such as geographic location, climate pattern, ocean dynamics, and varying forms of uh, settings. So actually, the, the the project also considered the uh, the you know the climate patterns, especially during El Nino and La Nina occurrences. Most of sea level trends from the Tigers in the east, that's the eastern seaboard, the north and the south of the Philippines showed sea level falling, okay? This is because, you know, uh, those type gauges are, already, are classified as short term, so less than 19. And they were dominated during the El Nino occurrence. So it to be, uh, uh, the El Nino during you know, very hot, not, not the normal temperatures. So then compared with that, uh, with the satellite altimetry data, they they show uh, they have a correlation. They show the same trend. Number three, the tide gauges with long period observations, that's more than 19 years, exhibit sea level rise. And likewise, the satellite altimetry showed the same. Sea level trend from tide gauges and the satellite altimetry data in Palawan area is on the rise. This is because warm water persists in the area now. So we meaning not only the tide gauges, there are other factors like the this climatic, climatic factors, not the, uh, the warm waters in the Palawan area persist. So as to these other satellite uh, images that were used, the 20 hertz frequency of the of satellite sea surface heights, there was a correlation of around 96.96 or 96% correlation of the tide gauge data and that uh, satellite altimetry of the, because the, the, the project, uh, I think, considered the one hertz uh, frequency for the satellite altimetry compared it with, with uh, 20 hertz. There, the 20 hertz is a much more 
uh, larger uh, correlation. So the measures, this is the name of the, I think this is the name of the satellite uh, data. Within, it showed, within, with 20 years of data showed uptrend of all sites, so meaning the 25. But they are showing, uh, they're showing uptrend in the sea surface height anomalies. The, so the results from the satellite altimetry for waters areas are surrounded by land masses show doubtful trends. This is because of the technical limitation of satellite altimetry. So I think they were not, they were not able to include any in these areas. The only non-climatic factors investigated in study is the, okay, the vertical land motion. This is the subsidence. Its contribution were significant in Cagayan de Oro and El Nido. I will not be showing you how much, but it's uh, really significant compared to the other eight, eight uh, co-located uh, tide stations, GNS co-located tide stations. So in Manila Bay, okay, where sea level is on the rise and accelerating at 13.3 millimeters per year. So for Namibia, we have 13.2. For that project, they have 13.13. So it's just a matter of uh, uh, the influence of vertical land motion is very minimal. So this probably would cause you know, um, some inconvenience for others. The, the contribution is only one, negative one millimeter per year for the five years data because the satellite, the GNS data that we have in Manila is only five years. So we don't know previous data. We don't have old data. This means that uh, there are other factors contributing to the sea level increase. So the location of the tide stations is probably one because it's uh, right now it's being located in the, at the back of the Philippine Coast Guard headquarters. So probably it's the platform. But uh, moving back, uh, some slides back, I show you the period, the three periods for the uh, computation of the rate for Manila. So for the 1947 to 19, 2021, we have 13.2. But if you remove the 1947 to 1965, you have 14.4. 14 14 That's the one meter that is missing. So meaning uh, from those data, I think it's also present in our sea level data. The one millimeter um, difference. So we can now attribute the one millimeter to the vertical land motion, if that's the case for our data. So again, number 10. So low cost GNS tide gaze, I think the, 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 that's one of the positive outcome. It's an outcome of the project. Yeah, we were able to develop a GNS, uh, low cost GNS tide gaze. That could be, you know, uh, could be adapted by Namibia. Okay, other project recommendations. Okay, this is the project recommendations taken from that uh, report. So consider vertical land motion in mapping, flooding, mapping flood inundation due to LSR. So they were saying that uh, you also consider uh, the land motion. Okay, so to determine VLM on other sites using the satellite data, PS in, in SAR. So in, this is the satellite, just the satellite data. So they are saying that uh, in the absence of uh, uh, other uh, ice stations with, with, with the co-located GNS, you can use the uh, PS INSAR data because of the high correlation between the actual data and the satellite data. That's 96%. Other local factors contributing to sea level rise can be identified to give planners a clear picture on which response is priority. This is just saying that uh, it's not true to every location of the country. It's not uh, right to say that the Philippines is, uh, the sea level rise in the Philippines is 
rising at the rate of 13.2 millimeters. That's not correct to say because the sea level rise is, you know, it's highly localized. Okay. So with that uh, recommendation, I, I think uh, they were right. The, the study, the research was right. So we already, actually, we already started on the monitoring of the vertical land motion. So we have nine, I was saying that we have nine stations already that uh, being you know, established in those locations. That's the San Fernando, Manila, Legaspi, El Nido, Brooks Point, in D1 Eastern Summer, that's in, where is this? I think Balanakan, Cagande Oro, and Davao City. Okay. So what I'm saying is we, we started uh, vertical land motion already, started monitoring. We have those data. So I, I mentioned it's started in 2015. Okay. So my concluding, this is uh, my concluding remarks on this subject matter. Well, for a management, I, I put, I deliberately put the bracket for coastal uh, because uh, we know that uh, the the coastal uh, can be can be affected by activities beyond that, like deforestation. So I, I put the coastal management or simply management plan should consider factors such as hydrological geological and economic data or information. So a systematic assessment of the man-made activities, meaning uh, most, uh, I would like to give emphasis on the groundwater extraction. So unnecessary environmental degradation, meaning deforestation or grazing, should be avoided as much as possible. Regulate, not totally ban, so perhaps regulate, control, or restrict groundwater extraction. Dams, flood control, irrigation construction to be avoided when necessary. So well, to, to, to mitigate uh, those, uh, because you know it's uh, really needed to mitigate probably we do some engineering engineering interventions if you want to uh, co construct those dams. Uh, so you have to redirect the natural flow, natural flow of uh, the water, of the, of the drainage system you have to, uh, you know, to, to redesign probably to, to maintain the natural flow of water from, uh, from the mountains. So land reclamation, well, should be avoided, should be avoided, okay? So another thing, in a heavy human habitation, coastal area with heavy agriculture and industrial development accelerates subsidence due to excessive groundwater river one. So we, we the, the study with the research project with UP, I think shows, shows that, okay? So land sub so really land subsidence contributes to SLR. Okay. So SLR and land subsidence are very well interconnected when in terms of the hydrologic cycle. So sea level rise and land subsidence are already in the collision course. Okay. So uh, uh, with that, I would like to close this. Uh, presentation that to mention a few a few remarks yeah <laughs> okay so to to pursue coastal uh, coastal development uh, there is always a natural price so meaning uh, those uh, of course, the effect of the sea level rise. So, therefore, therefore, climate change and land subsidence 
should be taken into account when predicting sea level rise in a given area, so localized. So this is uh, already given. The interrelationship were very well connected. I mean, the climate change and land subsidence are really interconnected. So they, you cannot separate the one from the other, especially in the already identified low, low, low lying areas. So the, the climate change and the land subsidence, these two factors should be independently accounted for because their variability in time and space. So with that, uh, I think this will end my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Sir Dennis, for that uh, lecture of yours. So to meron kayong questions uh, for Sir Dennis, please reserve it muna. We will be having a question and answer portion at the end of the topic ng ating second business person. So, if you have questions, you can freely type it on the live chat box ng YouTube where in mamaya is uh, iisa-isahin po natin siyang pupulutin para po pupulutin at babasahin para po masagot po ito ng ating mga resource person. Again, congratulations Sir Dennis for the very well thought presentation on uh, the connection between sea level rise and land subsidence. So, Go, let's go on to our second topic. Our second, our resource person for our second topic, uh, earned her, uh, his degree in electronics and communication in, and communications engineering at the Technological University of the Philippines, uh, last 2012. He has extensive experience in electronics engineering and physical oceanography, and handles instrumentation and controls the. Met ocean, met ocean equipment used for acquisition of meteorological and oceanographic data. Uh, he applies strong analyti analytical skills for tidal and current data processing and interpretation of physical oceanographic data and uses advanced ge uh, geographic information system and which he has basic knowledge in hydro hydrodynamic modeling. So he started his career uh, in the government to the National Mapping and Resource Information Authority as Oceanographer 2. And he uh, uh, rose from the rank up to this point in time. He, he now uh, heads the Oceanographic Survey Section of the Physical, Oceanograph Physical Oceanography Division of the hydrography branch. His training, sensor, uh, his training includes uh, training on ocean observation, systems and nautical charting, and capacity building, uh, uh, capacity building program on ocean observation and hydrographic surveying, which uh, he took it at the Korea Hydrographic and Oceanographic Agency in Busan, South Korea in 2015 and 2017 respectively. He also took up uh, training on uh, satellite radar altimetry concepts and data processing at the University of the Philippines it, last November 2020, last November 2017. He also had he also undergone as as a, as an ex, uh, uh, an exchange program on in science in Yokosuka, Japan, in December 2017. Friends, let us welcome our second resource person, Engineer John Brian O. Navarro. Take it away, Engineer JV. Hello, good morning, uh, Sir Jeff. Thank you for the brief introduction. So, start na tayo ng aking presentation. So, uh, thank you, Sir Dennis. Very informative na 
uh, presentation. Uh, I hope uh, na marami tayong tutunan at nakuha dun sa diniscuss ni Sir Dennis uh, in relation to uh, philippines no specifically yun sa uh, effects nga ng climate change so right now uh, i will be presenting the uh, ano pa ano pa ba yung pwede namin i-offer for the uh, climate change studies no so ito yung mga future ng RIA project proposals namin and experiences in relation to not only sea level observation but also to uh, climate change studies or map data na pwede natin gamitin for climate change studies so since uh, this is for the 2022 national climate change consciousness week so i am engineer Jan Brian Navarro and i will be presenting to you uh, this topic so let's start so for the outline so ano ba yung what what is the existing setup of uh, sea level observations or physical oceanographic observations here in the Philippines ano yung mga ongoing projects and developments and also ano ba yung mga future projects namin or yung way forward okay in relation to the uh, oceanographic uh, observation and that uh, yeah, climate change so existing setup natin, so it was discussed earlier by Sir Dennis Pedringas. Uh, so Physical Oceanography Division has 60 primary tide stations. It is located all throughout the Philippines from Batanes, Palawan, Tawi-Tawi, to Davao, to Visayas, Bicol. So paikot siya ng buong Pilipinas, no? transmission and the data can only be downloaded remotely. Ibig sabihin, 70% ho ng mga tide stations natin yung pwede namin i-access yung data. Okay? Remotely from the office. So, uh, yung ibang stations naman is pwede i-download through uh, most, uh, halos lahat naman, lahat naman ng stations namin is meron kami tinatawag na tide observers. Okay, all yung mga local uh, personal namin na nagbabantay, nagse-secure ng station at the same time, nagme-maintain sila ng ating mga stations, no? So, majority of the tide stations with near real-time transmission were powered by cellular internet telemetry. So, nagse-send sila through cellular data. And only 6 have satellite transmission capability or ITOC support. Meaning, ito yung kapag walang signal, uh meron sila ang uh, walang walang cellular signal ito yung meron silang satellite uh, transmission na kahit na ayun nga na continuous yung pag-send uh, sa amin ng data or send ng data uh, online so it is supported by the uh, uh, international uh, body no counterpart natin sa international so half of the tide stations also so this is only the existing setup no so Bear with me. Half of the tide stations have tide gauges that are 10 years old or more. Ibig sabihin, ma matagal na na nag-ooperate yung mga instruments natin na to. Kung makikita nyo, meron kami dito paper chart pa rin hanggang ngayon. No? So others are 5 years and others are 2 years old in operation. So the tide stations are located in coastal areas that are exposed in extreme weather and environmental conditions. So ano ba yung effect? For example, dito sa isang uh, tide station natin na portable type. Extreme weather conditions sa, uh, nasa may uh, dagat. Diba? So electronics yan. Eh. So partly, ang nangyayari is nagde-deteriorate siya ng mas maaga kumpara dun sa kanyang shelf life. Mostly, our sensors, our instruments, nagtatagal siya ng 3 years to 5 years. Okay? So isa yun sa mga challenges namin. Siyempre yung deterioration ng tide gauges. Uh, repair ng ating mga tide station structures. Ever since nga, yung ibang mga station natin nasa 10 years old na nga, na nakatayo, lalo na yung mga concrete types. And insufficient funds for the procurement of new or replacement instruments. Yun nga, yun yung mga challenges namin. No? Kasi for example, may isa kaming instrument na nasira yung isang sensor dahil dinaanan siya ng isang bagyo. So anong gagawin namin? So maghahanap kami ngayon ng sensor magpo-procure kami ng sensor. Uh, luckily, nakakahanap naman kami, but most of the time, pag kayong lager yung nasira or yung mismong instrument na naglalag ng sea-level data, so yung isa yung sa mga 
nagiging problema namin kasi hindi pa hindi kami pwedeng mag-procure basta-basta. Okay? Eh ang problema namin, meron kami 60 stations. And half noon is napakatatanda na. So paano kapag sabay-sabay sila nag-bug daw? So ang problema natin, magdi-discontinue yung ating sea level observation. Kung nakita niyo naman, meron kami doon sa sea level trends. Merong mga stations doon na nag-stop uh, ng operation. So sayang, uh, sayang na sayang yung data natin na pwede sanang magamit natin for our studies. Diba? Yun yung importance kung bakit uh, discuss ko ito is for us to be aware na meron tayong mga ganitong uh, equipment, meron tayong uh, office na nagmomonitor ng ganitong uh, uh, data, ang nagagather ng ganitong data. Diba? So, yun. So, so, so bakit nga ba kailangan natin ng continuous sea level observation. Bakit siya importante? Siyempre, uh, para uh, kapag nagkaroon tayo ng studies, like uh, dito, kung makita nyo, meron tayong sea level trends here. So, mas marami kasing data, di ba? If you have tons of data, so, mas, mas uh, kumbaga, mas, mas marami kang pwedeng i-graph or mas marami kang choices na pwede mong uh, gamitin yung data mo or ma-assess mo siya For example, this one is 1995 to 2020 or yung sea level trend ni Sir Dennis from 1947 to 2022. Paano kung may gaps ka doon? So sayang yung trend mo na yun na makuputol siya. ba? Diba? Parang ganun yung ano or parang hindi ka ganun ka-confident doon sa iyong uh, analysis. Okay? Or doon sa ibibigay mong uh, study. For example, you have a project, you have a coastal Uh, engineering development or magtatayo ka ng tulay or or uh, dikes sa mga gilid. So, kulang yung data mo, di ba? So, that's why uh, the more data na meron ka na napaka-ayos, napaka-ganda, dahil meron kang mga equipments na continuously 24-7 working. So, you will have a good data. So, you will have a reliable analysis and prediction. Okay? So, ayun. So ngayon, ano ba yung mga ongoing projects and development namin? So nakita niyo na yung existing setup namin. So previously, diniscuss din naman ni Sir Dennis na uh, nagkakandak din kami ng tidal current observations, ng wave observations. So isa pa yun sa mga data na meron kami. No? And then yung uh, uh, sea, sea water temperature and then yung salinity. So uh, kasama rin yun sa mga kailangan din natin na data, in observance nga, dun sa climate change and then its effect dun sa ating mga oceans. So ano ba yung mga ongoing projects and developments natin? So right now, we have the uh, proposal. Ito yung aming uh, National Ocean Data Exchange Service. Actually, this was uh, already funded. Or no project. Its uh, general uh, objective is to develop a repository or one-stop shop for the Philippine Oceanographic Data, which various stakeholders can access and contribute. Kung mapapansin nyo, na-highlight ko yung word na contribute. Bakit? Kasi ibig sabihin, uh, those who are in the academe or yung ibang mga uh, private companies na nag-gather ng oceanographic data, is pwedeng mag-send nila sa amin yung data for repository para pwede rin siyang magamit ng other, mga, other researchers, other studies. Kasi... Uh, for example, meron isang project yung isang academy that was funded. And then uh, after the uh, research or after the uh, produce after they produce the paper, so saan na pupunta yung data, di ba? Saan na pupunta yung raw data? So sayang uh, lalo na kung uh, they use uh, certain uh, technologies or bagong mga equipments to gather the data. Di ba? So sayang yung data kung hindi mapapakinabang ng other researchers. Okay? So kaya uh, Uh, we we uh, propose this uh, project nga no para this is in line din doon sa aming our, aming existing na National Oceanographic Data Center na kami na naman yung nagme-maintain or yung NODC so what are the specific objectives of this project is to digitize and rescue existing analog data from Namibia kung napapansin niyo kanina may pinakita akong paper chart so ito yon so meron kaming mga data no na since uh, 1947 pa or since ano pa na mga ganyang data no na nasa paper so uh, plano namin is i-digitize lahat siya 
for us to have a raw data na talagang pwede magamit in Excel na, parang direct na siya. No, di mo na kailangan kakunin pa yung papel and then sa ka mag-input. So lahat siya naka-input na. So ang tawag namin din doon is data rescue. Kasi papano na lang kung uh, uh, nagkaroon ng problema or nabasa yung mga paper charts. So yun sa, yun sa mga problems namin. Also to conduct inventory of data not only from Namria but also from other oceanographic center of the Philippines. Para magkaroon tayo ng common format or standardization. di ba? Kasi pag, example, ano ba yung mga common uh, format na kailangan ng isang uh, uh, study? So CSV format, text files. So yun, naka, naka ganung file na sila lahat. So hindi siya naka ASCII file or raw file data from the equipment. So nakasort na siya. And to develop a system for data storage, management, and access, ensure quality control as well as systematic backup. Okay? To develop data products targeted for specific scientific industry needed. Example, software application for tidal uh, prediction, tidal digital current atlas, wave climate. So isa rin yun sa nakapaloob dito sa aming nodes project. So one of the outputs uh, naman ito is yung ocean database. Siyempre pag sinabi mong database, andyan na lahat. No? And the, ito yung PH Tides mobile app which is a uh, existing project ngayon ng uh, one of our colleagues here in Ambria for his uh, capstone project sa kanyang uh, uh, Masters in Development Management sa DAP. So, part siya ng uh, plan namin dito sa National Ocean Data Exchange Service. Okay? So, ano ba yung update namin ngayon dito? No? So, the project was partially approved with the procurement of computer servers and wide format and continuous scanners para nga sa digital rescue natin. However, the operating expenses for the data management system and hiring of support personnel for the rescue and digitization of data is still being proposed during annual budget planning. So, kumbaga nakabili na kami yung ano yung ng uh, para, para sa servers and the scanners but we are lacking for the uh, operational expenses because our budget is very limited doon sa aming uh, mandated operation which is the maintenance of stations and data processing and analysis, no? So yun yung update namin doon sa project na yun. So ano ba yung mga ano namin naman? Uh, future uh, projects related to sea level observation. Not only sea, ito nga sabi ko, not only sea level observation, but also other oceanographic and meteorological data. Lahat ng data related sa ocean. Lalo na if it will uh, be used for climate change studies. First is the enhancement of ocean observation and infrastructure development. Traditionally, tidal observation stations are established to support hydrographic surveys and charting. Uh, kaya na-establish yung uh, physical oceanography division under the hydrography branch is for the uh, purpose of surveys and charting. Okay? However, oceanographic data and information is steadily expanding its applications to other marine and or uh, ocean environmental sectors. So oceanographic or tidal data being continuously collected and recorded are vital information and determination long-term sea level changes and ocean variability in our locality. Ito yung diniscuss kanina, Sir Dennis. However, during, ito, during extreme meteorological conditions, real-time sea level data is a very critical input to other relevant government agencies. Ano ibig sabihin nito? Uh, kapag kami bagyo ho, uh, we have partner uh, partnership with Pag-asa, which is lahat po ng tide stations is monitor namin. And the uh, Yung changes doon sa sea level is nakikita namin. Mayroong point, uh, point 0.2 meters, point 0.3 meters, point 0.5 meters na change in sea level. And then uh, mayroong kaming format na sinesend namin sa pag-asa for them para mas maging aware sila for their uh, forecasting and warnings. Okay. Uh, appropriate approach to disaster mitigation and timely issuance of the necessary warning systems to coastal communities is will somehow be enhanced. Okay. Ano ba yung uh, uh, bakit uh, ano ba yung meron dito sa enhancement ng ocean observation? So meron kaming enhanced infrastructure design. So kung mapapansin niyo, hindi lang siya basta water level sensors, meron din siyang relative humidity, temperature, solar radiation sensor, barometer, rain gauge, uh, wind speed and direction sensors or anemometers. Uh, the data lagger solar panels, pwede din siyang lagyan ng salinity sensors, conductivity sensors or current meter wave sensor sa ilalim, 
So kumbaga magiging isang ano siya, uh, hindi lang siya oceanographic station but also a meteorological station. So uh, Met Ocean Station na siya. Yun yung uh, bagong tawag namin sa kanya. Actually, uh, this is also supported by pag-asa since very limited nga yung kanilang uh, area na meron silang mga station. So as part of our uh, enhancement, so sinama na namin buong stations natin kasi nakita nyo naman doon sa pinakita ko kanina, all uh, paikot sa Pilipinas na meron tayong mga side stations. So we incorporate this design. no? So also, kasama din dito sa infrastructure design is itong hybrid data transmission systems. Uh, na discuss ko kanina na no, mostly or halos karamihan sa mga stations natin is cellular networks. May, we have experiences uh, na lagi kaming nat, napuputulan ng transmission lalo na kapag may bagyo. Di ba, mostly kapag dadaan yung bagyo sa isang lugar, is napuputol yung ating transmission systems or nawawalan tayo ng signal. So that's uh, one of the challenges that we uh, are experiencing no? na dapat naming itakel, which is uh, masosolve dito sa enhanced data infrastructure ay, namin. Okay? So kasama dito kasi yung uh, real-time data transmission using satellite. So incorporate na namin sa kanila lahat is merong uh, satellite transmission. And aside from that, uh, ito nga, part din niya yung nodes project. So magta-tie up silang dalawa. You, you upgrade you upgrade the uh, monitoring stations. Also, you upgrade, uh, in-upgrade mo yung, yung uh, servers or yung database system. So i-upgrade din natin yung ating uh, uh, observation stations. Okay? From tide stations going to a meta-ocean station. Okay? So yun yung aming future vision here. So also... Siyempre, for the general public is magkakaroon din tayo ng data visualization and web display. Kung saan makikita natin dito, ano ba yung real-time natin na forecast based dun sa station, ano ba yung water level? Ano yung salinity, uh, ano itong, um, uh, salinity level, ano itong uh, yung wind, uh, wind speed and direction values? Diba? Kasama siya sa monitor dito sa data visualization web display na kumbaga kapag clinic mo yung isang item here so mag uh, lalabas siya ng mga data na kailangan mo including the uh, the uh, metadata ng isang station so interactive and as well uh, pwede rin siyang uh, makapag-download ng data or ng raw data here so yun yung very ano namin sa public So aside from that, aside from the enhancement of the data infrastructure, so we also planning to develop the hydrodynamic model and ocean forecasting here in the Philippines. So we are inspired by uh, our previous training in uh, Indonesia. So uh, they, they teach us how they uh, conduct the hydrodynamic, how they, they prepare the hydrodynamic models, as well as incorporate it into their uh, system. So the development of hydrodynamic models will improve the navigation as well as research studies of the current ocean current flow and wind waves between the Philippine Islands. Kasi kung, kung familiar kayo sa windy, sa windy kasi uh, it uses satellite data, it uses a global data. So why not approach, approach natin siya with the local data that we have? Okay, lalo na sa ating inter-islands. So mas magiging accurate yung ating maipoprovide or magiging mas reliable doon sa local part ng data o oh, ganito siya ah, ganito yung current flow ganito katataas yung waves at this point in time so pwede natin siyang mag no so yun nga sabi ko nga having a reliable dynamic model will support accurate ocean forecasting that can be available for public access another one is the deployment of oceanographic buoys or met ocean buoys this is parang katulad din siya nung uh, enhancement but this one is offshore or ilalagay natin siya medyo malayo doon sa ating uh, uh, malalayong areas okay syempre the philippines being an archipelago with vast marine natural resources has limited meteorological and oceanographic data at natin yon offshore islands therefore deploying met ocean buoys in areas will ensure that the philippines has enough data in the area for these activities so, yung buoys, uh, we are planning here. For example, we will put uh, oceanographic, met ocean buoys in the uh, Philippine rice region. 
for us to observe, lalo na kung magkakanta tayo ng mga other mga research studies doon in the future or magtay ng uh, something doon ng mga coastal engineering projects. So we have an existing data na na nag-gather doon sa area. Likewise, uh, pwede rin doon sa ating uh, uh, KIG or sa West Philippine Sea. Di ba? Doon sa Pag-asa Island, pwede tayong maglagay doon ng Met Ocean Buoys. Na pwede natin din siyang magamit for our studies. Okay? So isa yan sa mga uh, uh, future na nakikita namin dito na part ng uh, physical oceanography uh, physical oceanographic observations natin. Another one is the tidal stream or current charts or atlas. So ito naman is uh, ano ba yung tidal stream or current? So those are horizontal movement of water that is affected by tides. So yung tidal stream or current is arrived by deploying yung acoustic Doppler current profiler kung narinig nyo yung kanina sa discussion Sir Dennis. So is a type of instrument na nagbe-measure racking setup na kung saan nakalagay siya sa isang barko or sa boat. And then the goal kasi dito is to incorporate yung tidal stream sa ating nautical or we can produce a tidal current as ano ba yung movement ng uh, current doon and gaano ba siya kalakas. Okay, based on IHO standards. Okay? So yun yung isa sa mga uh, future na nakikita din namin dito, no? And lastly, uh, isa to sa mga napansin namin dito sa Philippines. So, we wanted to have a high tide flooding monitoring and bulletin. So, the aim of the project is to assess the effects of high tide flooding to the coastal communities in the Philippines in relation to its local economy, agriculture, infrastructure, livelihood, and many more. Areas that are susceptible to high tide flooding will be monitored, installed float sensors and GNS as instrument to measure the flood level and land subsidence in the area. So the flood that caused by increasing high tides is remotely monitored online and bulletin on time of its occurrence will be available for the public. So kung, kung uh, mapapansin nyo, maraming news na lumabas na kung saan yung mga areas na hindi dati napapasok ng tubig is naiintrude na. Or may mga areas na kapag kabubaha, hindi matagal bumababa yung tubig. So for example na lang sa part ng Bulacan, na kapag nag-high tide, naiintrude sila. So gano'n ba kalawak yung nakocover ng high tide intrusion doon sa areas na yon And ano ba yung mga lugar na merong experiences na gano'n? Okay? Uh, nung nagkaroon ng supermoon before, so na-experience ng iba't ibang par sa iba't ibang parte ng Pilipinas, na nagkaroon si na kung saan yung coastal areas is na-intrude siya ng high tide during high tide or during spring tides is to have a database of that kung ano ba yung mga areas na prone doon sa high tide intrusion or high tide flooding and also to give them uh, bulletins lalo na doon sa ating NDRR counterpart so we will be having a uh, conversation with our uh, national disaster risk reduction and also doon sa mga affected areas na na possible magkaroon ng ganitong uh, type na problema okay so yun Uh, bale, ito yung isa sa mga ano namin, sa mga uh, future na projects na planong i-implement dito sa uh, Namuria. So, yun lang. And uh, uh, I hope na marami kayong uh, natutunan and uh, kung may mga questions kayo, Ah, uh, yan paki-raise na lang siguro after my after this uh, presentation. So, thank you so much for listening. Thank you Engineer JB for that uh, lecture of yours. Oh, well, actually, uh, kanina ang dami ko nang dinaldal na introduction sa pero nakalimutan ko i-mention yung yung topic mo. So, ah, uh, yun nga ang diniskus nga ni Engineer JB. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, Yes po. You're muted. Ah, okay po. Ano yung naka-mute po ba ako? Okay po. So, yun nga. So, as uh, as what I've said, uh, sa haba ng introduction ko kay Engineer JV kanina, nakalimutan kong i-mention kung ano yung topic niya. So, he discussed future ng RIA project proposals and experiences in relation to the sea level observation in the Philippines. So, kita doon sa presentation ni Engineer JV na ng RIA is very proactive sa uh, pagtalakay nga ng issue 
on sea level rise and other information regarding to maritime para at least mas lalo nating mapagsalbihan ang general public. So, we are now in the question and answer portion, part of the program. So, so far, I have uh, three questions dito. So, kung yung iba, uh, pwede, nyo, pwede kayo magtanong pa. So, unahin ko na ito, Sir Dennis. Uh, according to YouTube name, Death Row 015, regarding sea level rise daw po, daw localize yung rate ng increase sa sea level rise, how will this affect our chart? Tapos sinugundahan pa niya na meron, daw, meron naman daw tayong tide and current table and well to support navigators. How do we incorporate the SLR in our tide and current tables? Okay, uh, thank you for that uh, question. No? For, for the first one, how do we uh, incorporate in our charts? I, 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 I don't think we can uh, uh, we can uh, edit, edit or we can update regularly in the same manner that we monitor sea level rise annually. I don't think we can, that's impractical to always, you know, always uh, uh, incorporate the, the, the latest datum for our charts. At least that would be impractical for, for it to be incorporated in the charts. Uh, what we, we envision, we just, you know, we just uh, uh, publish uh, this local mean sea level data using you know our in the in the future projects you can see that in our uh, in our website probably and for the tide table yes at that table we 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 are very limited to the uh, number of pages of the uh, tide table so we would like as much as possible we would like to uh, uh, publish all our available data in that book to assist our our navigators, but again, uh, putting a 265 times and highs of uh, uh, tide tidal information in that book would be again practical. Uh, and yet again, we will be the the ways forward that uh, engineer Navarro mentioned would be uh, part of those you know uh, enhancement of the delivery of uh, tidal information to the public and to the users. Thank you, Jen. Okay, thank you, Sir Dennis. A question, question po from Ms. Rosaline Suntilianosa. Yung, yung daw po bang mga tide data natin downloadable and available to the public? Well, uh, if you are... Thank you, thank you for that question. If you are asking that uh, you can uh, download it outright, I think we have uh, limitations still on the open data policy. So you have still have to, you know, to write a request that we will give you the data. But if you are looking at the outright uh, downloadable, uh, I think the, 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 we have to wait for the open data policy for Namibia so that uh, we can uh, put up in the website that it would be downloadable. But in any case, in our website, we have the textual information on the times and heights of the predicted uh, tidal data. But if you're looking at the historical data that you can download anytime, I think that's the thrust of the POD or NAMRIA to provide them uh, at any time if they want to, to download the data. It, it's, in the, it's in the plan, it's in the strategic plan to provide them free and downloadable in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sir Dennis. Uh, questions pa po? Do we have questions pa? So, ah, sige, ako na lang magtatanong. Sir, yung, technically, yung topic, yung diniscuss natin kasi, yung sa webinar title natin, you have, kumbaga parang, you, you have two options na parang, pinapipili natin yun dun sa issue nga ng sea level rise. Is it climate change or land, sans, land subsidence? In your expert opinion, sir, anong sa dalawang yun ang mas malaki ang contribution talaga pagdating sa 
uh, sea level rise sa Philippines. Expert opinion. <laughs> Adjective, yeah. But, well, uh, if we tend to believe the, the project with the, uh, the UP, and then I think uh, it is supported by factual data, the greatest contribution will be the climate change. So for the vertical land movement, in the case of Manila, it's very minimal at one millimeter per year. So for others, they, they may call it minimal, but some, some scientists, they call it already a, uh, you know, a big, uh, big amount. So it depends on how, how people see it. So, well, you have ways to consider the time frame of uh, the, that, uh, that uh, data. So if you quantify one millimeter as against 13 millimeters per year, uh, well, as I mentioned in my, my, my presentation, there are other local factors. There are other local factors. It may be climatic or non-climatic factors. It would be anthropogenic. So, well, anthropogenic is an offshoot of uh, climate change. So, so if you are looking at who, who has the greater contribution, it's probably uh, the climate change. But you cannot, uh, like I said, you cannot separate one from the other. There will be a, a I, I mentioned coupling effect. So they are integrated. So what we are doing now is, what, what we are now, what do we have now data is all those uh, that, that, that the parameter, the data that affect the, the sea level is incorporated already in, a date, in our data. And it's a matter of uh, looking at what, what are their contributions to that uh, value in the sea level. Okay. Hey, thank you very much, Sir Dennis, for that answer. Uh, another question po kay from Death Row 015. Sirs, meron din po ba tayong data regarding rate of increase ng temperature sa Philippine waters? Well, uh, in, during the project with the UP, uh, we, we, we tried to look at the surface temperature. Uh, I, I, I did not already mention about it in the presentation, but the whole, the whole report, uh, we do we we did the comparison of the uh, sea surface heights collected from our tide stations. Uh, well, the the trend is not really uh, established because there are a lot of data gaps. So we tried to look at that the temperature. I I did not already mention, but we we look at the temperature data that we have and the from the satellite satellite data so we, we the project did a comparative comparison so we cannot probably we only show the trend uh, and there are there are very few correlation so so well, in the future probably we can uh, we, we can uh, right, uh, we can standardize that we or we will require that uh, all the 65 stations We'll have to have a 24-hour 24 24-hour 24 data observation on temperature and salinity. But it's not conclusive. Yes, the CSL project already looked at the, the density change and salinity and the temperature. Okay. Okay, thank you, Sir Dennis. Ito, uh, a question from uh, Sir Gilbert Albiola. Does our data on sea level rise correspond with our sea temperature data? Is our seas also warming? Well, uh, well, uh, well. The our scientists say that uh, climate change is an offshoot of global warming. So the word global warming is the Earth is warming. So if we we did have uh, this climate change connected to sea level as yes, you can say that they are warming, but our, since our, some of our data is still uh, on a classified as short term, especially those uh, climatic factors that were considered by the project during El Nino and La Nina. So there are two, there are, there, these are two opposing, uh, uh, phenomenon. So 
in the areas during during uh, El Nino, the sea level is uh, low, while during La Nina, so we still have to consider those uh, climatic factors uh, in our data. And again, I said our data captured all this this uh, phenomenon, so we have to look at this further. Okay, thank you, Sir Dennis. Uh, ito, uh, I believe this question is for Engineer JB. Engineer JB, according to uh, 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 Winsley Nilod asks, meron daw po ba tayong free application for, hi uh, for hydrography? Free? Opo. Uh, ano nga ito? Yun po. Free application for hydrography. Ano ba to Mobile app ba to? Mobile app. Oo, parang ganun. Actually, sa ngayon, uh, wala pa tayo available for uh, hydrography. Pero we are developing po yung pH types. It is more uh, for uh, yung parang tides, tide prediction para mag-view mo doon yung uh, magyayaring tides today. Ang ganun. Oh, para sa susunod na araw. Para makikita mo siya. Parang tides and current table siya na nasa mobile app na namake graph. So ganun siya yung aming uh, target na ma-develop. Yeah, thank so, you. Hopefully it's, soon. It's, 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 diniscuss ko kanina. Yeah, para exciting yun, ano? Para at least mayroon na tayong idea kung, kung anong oras yung high tide, kung kailan yung low tide. So maganda yun. Sige, looking forward tayo dyan. So another question po, uh, ito, kay, kay Sir Jimuel Tamayo, according to him, contributors to SNR are also groundwater extraction oil, gas exploration and mining, and land reclamation. Question niya po, meron daw po ba tayong permits or clearances na kailangan kuhanin from us ng mga proponents po ng mga ganitong klaseng projects and activities? Yes, thank you for that question. I understand you, 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 you should help. Uh, I think from the National Waters Board, for the extraction of groundwater, I think you have, you have permit. I think sa local they also have some uh, uh, how you call this resolutions or uh, how do they call that in local? So I think uh, not not uh, actually widespread. I think not widespread the permits, but uh, I think in Manila, I think that's how they control or regulate already the groundwater extraction. You have to have a permit. As for the oil and gas, I'm I'm not really familiar. Uh, I think the DOE has sort of a uh, licensing or, or you know they have this kind of uh, regulation also in their in their uh, it's in, it's within their mandate. I think you have to have uh, to secure those kind of permits. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, question focus from Mr. Jeff Hunt. Uh, Ina-acknowledge daw po ba ng pag-asa ang namriya tidal data as their source when they do real-time weather reporting? Uh, I think yes. I think yes, Jeff. Especially uh, I attended uh, some of their IEC or presentations. I think they they are really, very, they express their thanks uh, for namriya that, that we are providing them real-time uh, data. Real time data. I think they have already expressed their appreciation for our data. They always acknowledge us. Thank Good to know, sir. Uh, from uh, Ma'am Senya Andres, uh, uh, ito, I believe it's for JD. Uh, on the Ways Forward projects, do you plan to partner with other relevant government agencies to implement them? Hello, Ma'am. Yes, sir. Actually, yung mga involved po, for example, yung ating uh, NDRR, yung ating Philippine Coast Guard or Philippine Navy, specifically for the deployment ng ating and security ng ating mga oceanographic buoys. Mga ganun po. Good to know. Thank you, JV. Another question from Ms. Rosalyn Suntelianosa. How about tides and current data for renewable energy technologies? Meron na po bang mapping ng possible sites for these types of renewable source of energy? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Jeff. Uh, 
for the tides, it's already well established uh, where they are, where are, where are those uh, strong currents. So usually, in general, they are located in the straits, like Surigao Strait. Uh, so it's already well identified, well mapped. The, 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 the data, we also have some preliminary uh, data that were shared. So with the, with the DOE. So I think during their their presentations, I think they were already mentioning about where those uh, tidal currents are. As uh, for the wave, we have, I think, 2019 or 18, we have a consultant from uh, DOE that uh, process uh, on the possibility of mapping the wave. So just like I said, if we only I have concentrated in uh, conducting observations of wave because of, uh, we don't have yet the uh, the specific uh, uh, equipment for that one. So, well, uh, according to to some of our data that we don't really realize, then one of uh, our our stations in Quezon, in uh, Palawan, and some I think in was that Mati. Mati, we, we, well, unconsciously, we also, we have the, what we call the WTG, the wave tide gauge, and we tried to look at that uh, data. Yes, indeed, we have uh, wave the data for that one. And we, during that, uh, that consultant, uh, when, when they approach us, they, we correlate the data, the wave data, with that of the, uh, satellite, uh, the wave watch data. That's a, that's a, I think private, just like a private uh, international organization that uh, they collect uh, wave data and they it's available in the internet. We did some, uh, we did some correlation. Uh, very few stations have uh, have close correlation. So, but if you plot, if you map those uh, international data. They, they, they show that the potential for wave uh, energy resources are to the northeast of the country. That's probably uh, in, in Cagayan Valley, uh, in the Isabella part, and that of the side, the northwest, that's the uh, probably Corimao, uh, the San, until San Fernando, and on the Palawan, Palawan area. So we have that map. That's why we targeted in our plans, in our survey plans, we targeted those areas for our wave observation in the coming years. So we, we have information, but those are low resolution uh, data from the satellite. So we try to target this area. So we have information on where those areas. So you, may, you notice that they are, Offshore and they are in the open open area, so I think that's the that's the uh, idea there to get uh, you know uh, big waves. So if you you notice there is a surfing capital somewhere in the north, it's in San Fernando, so I think that would be justified. And there's also one in D1. There's also a surfing resort there in Sargao. In Sargao, actually, we already conducted the wave observation there, but still. How what's the what's the requirement for a renewable energy just like wave to be commercially viable? That's the question. So we can we can uh, we we have we can have uh, the data. So that's the question. How how high how how big the waves that could be a uh, commercially viable for renewable energy? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sir Dennis for that very comprehensive uh, answer to that question. So I guess we have two last questions bago po tayo magtapos. Uh, the first of the last question uh, is how, uh, again, from that row 015, how about movement in tectonic plates? Meron din po bang epekto ito sa SLR? Meron din po bang areas na kung saan e pababa ang trend? Yes, yes. Uh... For the again, as I think the project with uh, with uh, with uh, this is for the question number two with uh, UP, there are some uh, uh, up. Uh, you mean uh, up trend? Up well, up trend is 
right, uh, sea level is rising. But uh, probably he was he was mentioning about the is there a low low trend? We, we have some negative uh, negative trends in that uh, in that uh, particular research project. Uh, I I don't. So there are some there are some that uh, have a negative. I think uh, uh, Takloban Takloban we have negative uh, trends, not the positive ones. And for the first question, the tectonic. So I mentioned uh, one of our slides, the other type of the anthropogenic activity. That's the natural, that's the tectonic one. So, well, it, it somehow contributes to sea level rise. When uh, those uh, produced by the tectonic activity produces, uh, you know, uh, sediments, those sediments are then transported to our rivers. And one of the factors that affect the sea level is the sediment runoff, sediment runoff. So, so yes, uh, tectonic, especially the tectonic uh, process that occurs probably in the mountains, those, uh, those uh, river runoffs will transport those sediments to the ocean. So this, there, there is somehow a effect on those uh, uh, tectonic process. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Last question for, from Mr. J. Sepe. How about reclamation projects po, sir? For example, po sa Manila Bay, nagiging cost din po ba siya ng SLR? Yes, again, uh, it was mentioned that, that uh, one of the probably uh, major major uh, factor that affects uh, the sea level rise is reclamation, especially in a, in a constricted area like the bay. Okay. you try to look at this my analogy you try to look at a a you know a glass of water you put some rocks or even ice you notice that the sea level is somehow rises right so if you put many objects in that glass the there there will be a time that the water from the glass will tip off so that's the analogy of the one so if you reclaim that's for the constricted areas like base, but uh, perhaps in open sea, that's probably because you know the, it's open. The area of the water to land is very uh, big, so probably that would not that would be a uh, negligible. So Manila Bay, as of now, there are lots of reclamation, but uh, we try or we try to look at the scientific side. We look at the what we call the tidal constituents is still on the manageable level. So meaning they're not still on the uh, they're not still changing. So one of the effects of the land reclamation or the bathymetry, it would it would somehow uh, change the the constituents, the tidal constituents of that area. So for Manila Bay, it's not yet really that alarming. We are trying to compare the tidal constituents. So. Uh, that's probably the basis on the DNR's approval of the reclamation in Manila Bay. Okay. So, kumbaga parang in other words, sir, pumapasok pa siya sa threshold. Well, still, yeah. Oh, yes. But they will, well, you, you still have those other data, like how, how do you compute for the tidal loading? Because you you put the uh, land on the ocean depends on the basement so it is somehow compact the the land beneath it so the tidal load we call it the tidal loading sediment loading so so those factors are, are, are i mentioned the other hydrological factors are have to be considered in all these uh, activities okay Thank you, sir. Thank you for answering all those technical questions. Sabi nga ni, sabi nga ni, ni Sir Michael Jason Asuncion, good job po kayo uh, for answering Thank you. those Thank technical you. questions. Kasi technically naman talaga, minsan yung mga, mga pagsagot natin sa mga ganyong klaseng tanong, kailangan talaga pinag-iisipang mabuti, hindi yung bara-bara natin sinasagot. So again, congratulations for Sir Denny, Sir JB for answering those questions. Uh, uh, before we end this uh, webinar, may I call on uh, the director of the Geospatial Information System Management Branch, 
Director Febrina E. Damaso for the closing remarks. Hi, Jeff. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of our administrator, Yusek Peter N. Chanko, first and foremost, siyempre, I would like to express my gratitude to Director Valenzuela of the Hydrography Branch. And siyempre, to the speakers, Mr. Dennis Bringas and Engineer John Brian Navarro for their excellent presentation to our webinar today. And siyempre, hindi ko rin makakalimutan to the organizers, uh, Jeff Kudala and support staff for a job well done. Secondly, uh, your attendance today in this webinar is very much appreciated. I hope you had a very fruitful learning journey by sharing with you, you know, additional information or additional knowledge on climate change in relation to what Namri is doing. And hope to see you again in our upcoming and future webinars. Again, good morning, thank you, and have a nice day. Back maraming, to you, Jeff. Maraming maraming salamat, Bospes, for also supporting us in our webinars. So this is the last webinar for 2022. So maraming maraming pong salamat sa lahat ng mga suki natin boss na since the beginning of this year na uma-attend ng ating pong webinar ay patuloy pa rin pong uma-attend ng ating webinar sa huli pong pagkakataon ngayong 2022. At asahan po ninyo na magkakaroon pa rin po tayo ng maraming malaman na webinar pagdating po ng 2023. So before we officially end, uh, uh, before we officially end po our webinar is nakapost na po sa ating live chat uh, nakapin nakapost at nakapin na po sa ating live chat ang ating, ating po attendance and evaluation form link so i suggest you go accomplish it uh, dahil po medyo strict po tayo pagdating po sa accomplishment po ng form na yan dalian po ang yung pong magiging basihan or basis for the preparation and distribution of your certificate of attendance. So alalahanin po natin na despite of the fact na kahit na po kayo ay umaten po ng aming webinar pero hindi po kami nakatanggap ng inyong attendance evaluation form is hindi pa rin po kayo mabibigyan po ng uh, certificate of attendance. Ang ating pong form link ay mananatili po bukas o tatanggap ng kanyang responses hanggang 11.59 po ng gabi ngayong araw lang po na ito. So ulitin ko po, ang ating pong attendance evaluation form link ay open lang po until 11.59 p.m. of this date. So starting tomorrow, uh, starting 12, uh, midnight po, hindi na po siya tatanggap. So no, cer no evaluation form, no certificates po. And again, uh, ito po, uh, may nagbigay po sa akin ng note. Uh, don't forget daw po, don't forget to... Like, share, and subscribe to our Namriya Gov PH YouTube account. So para po kayo ay automatic pong updated sa lahat po ng ganap ng National Mapping and Resource Information Authority. So dito po kami madalas po nagpapandap ng ating webinar considering na madami po kayong mga nagre-rehistro. And I believe uh, in this particular webinar, more than 700 po kayong nagre-rehistro. So I'm expecting at least at the most eh, makakalahati man lang tayo ng attendance for this webinar po. So wag pong kakalimutan po uh, na mag-share, like, and subscribe ng ating YouTube account po na ng Real Gold page. So muli po, uh, this is Jeffrey A. Kodala, your activity lead slash uh, host facilitator ng ating pong webinar in the observance of the 2022 National Climate Change Week, National Climate Change Consciousness Week. So, nagpapaalam po at nagpapasalamat po sa inyong lahat sa pagtatilik po ng aming webinar. Maraming maraming salamat po at maligayang araw po sa ating lahat.